Let's learn, let's learn how to be smart stewards and stewards of God's Word. That's what we really need to know. We don't need to know all of the history. We don't, it's important. We don't need to know all the other things in the Bible or in the, in the world to qualify what we're preaching. We need to know God's Word and why we believe God's Word and be able to talk about God's Word. Uh, my first slide, too smart for your own good. Do we sometimes become too smart for our own good? Do, does the world, the non-Christian, are they so smart they're dumb? I mean, think about it. Um, these scientists or these people that aren't scientists that, that, that refute God's Word, refute the Bible, refer, refute everything. They don't believe anything of it. Or they re believe this part of here, and this part of here, and this part of here. They don't, you got to take the whole Word of God or none of it. That's, that's the stand I take. That's the stand this church takes. We cannot change the world by being wishy-washy. And that's what happens when you only take part of the Bible. The verse, verse 14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, of, Spirit, of, the, of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. The natural man is the unsaved, the person that has no relationship with Jesus Christ. They may have heard it. They may have even grown up in church but they've never surrendered their life to Christ. Foolishness, I put that. Have you ever been asked, how can you believe that? How can you believe in the virgin birth? How can you believe in the resurrection? How can you believe that he's coming back for you? If you've shared your faith at all, you've heard that. If you haven't shared your faith, you need to, okay? If you're a Christian. I've been asked that many times, and I, by the shaking of heads, I know others in here have too. But it says, the next part of it says, they cannot understand. A natural man, unsaved, cannot understand. Uh, he does not have the Holy Spirit. You know, you can read the Bible cover to cover, and if you don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, you'll never understand it. It's just, it's just like a regular textbook or a science book or a history book or anything else. A book of literature. When I do children's worship, or when I was doing children's worship, I always presented the kids with the Bible the very first day of school after the church. You know, they have school and they go to church, or they, we did gave the Bible and they went to school the next day. But I always presented them with the Bible. And I always told them that this word right here, this Bible, has everything you need in life. It's got science, creation. It's got history. It's got math. Noah's Ark was used for the math. The tabernacle was used in math. It's got poetry. Proverbs, Psalms, Book of Ruth, I think, has some history to it, I mean, poetry to it. All those books, it has everything. Literature, the perfect Word of God. But we don't read it. We don't study it. We don't learn it. And if you do, and you're not a Christian, you don't understand it. Oh, that's just a bunch of fables. That's just a bunch of garbage. How can you believe that? I love that. I always tell them, I have nothing to lose if I'm wrong. You have everything to lose if I'm right. Spiritually appraised. That was a hard one. I'll get back to it. But what that means is, is you don't have the spirit with living within you. You don't know it. The Word of God was written to believers. It wasn't written to the sinner, except for to gain salvation. That's what the Word of God is. It's a love letter to us, to instruct us, to tell us how to live our lives. It tells us the way to salvation 
and how to live a life pleasing to God. That's what the Word of God is. The unsaved cannot understand it unless God speaks through their hearts through the Holy Spirit. And, and you'll, you'll, some people don't agree with that. But a person, an unsaved person, can read the Bible cover to cover, but until God speaks to them in their heart, they'll never understand it. It's just another book. So they can't understand it, and that's what this verse is saying. They cannot understand it until the Holy Spirit comes in. When God speaks to your heart, uh, it is when the Holy Spirit comes to you and you start to understand and accept. When you became a Christian, God spoke to you. As you grow, the Holy Spirit still speaks to you. As you learn, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. When you have your private prayer time, your quiet time, the Holy Spirit speaks to you through His Word, and I believe in your mind. Okay? I believe He speaks to us individually. I don't believe that... Um, I don't know how to say this right. I don't believe that, that I can stand up here and preach and tell everybody outside of what God's Word says that God spoke to me and it not be in a line with God's Word. Is that, did I say that right? That, that we have, sometimes we have people that say, well, God spoke to me and it doesn't line up with God's Word. God didn't speak to them. Uh, case in point, the Jim Jones incident, way back when. God didn't speak to him. I don't believe. They wouldn't have been doing all the things that they were doing outside of God's will. Uh, the the other, other people out there that are cults, God doesn't use, doesn't speak to them that way. When he speaks to your heart, comes into you and you start understanding, you will accept. Then you will gain a real understanding of what the Word of God means. Psalms 119, verse 8, I put in my notes wrong, verse 8, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from the law. What's he saying? God opened my eyes up so I can understand what the Bible, and when you open my eyes, it's opening your heart. Your eyes are the gate to the heart. The spirit, of love, uh, the spirit of the living God within you helps you understand God's Word and purpose for your life. I know people that have been Christians for 30, 40, 50 years. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand what, are they still saved? Yes. I can't be their judge. But they haven't studied. They haven't looked at the Word of God and tried to apply it to their lives. And it does tell you the purpose for your life. I chased money for many years. That wasn't the purpose of my life for God. But it was the purpose for my life. When God gets a hold of you, you're, you're changed. It's foolishness when an unbeliever, to the unbeliever until, he, until God pricks his heart. Just a question, have you ever shared your faith and they look at you like you're an idiot? They do. But the great thing of that is, is but later they come to you and they understand. It doesn't matter that you didn't gain it. What matters is, is they gained it and you had a part in it. That's what matters. Not that you didn't, I mean, yes, I'd love to say I had thousands that had received Christ because of me. I can't say that. But I can say I've got thousands that ended up being Christians because of me sharing my faith somewhere along the line. It's still part of God's plan. Next slide. Spiritually smart. But he who is spiritually appraises all things yet to himself appraised by one. Spiritual. If you are spiritually appraised, if you are a Christian, if you are a believer, you can understand the things of the Spirit. 
but you have to still, God's just not going to throw it out there at you. You've got to apply things. You've got to apply it to your life. He understands and evaluates all things. If you're a Christian, you understand and you evaluate things of God and things that are going on in the earth. Let's think about the coronavirus, okay? The coronavirus. I don't understand every, all the hype on it, but I do understand the fact that the world is running. The world is afraid. And because the world is afraid, all of this hype comes out, and that's part of it. Now, I'm not saying there's not a coronavirus. I'm not saying that we don't need to be cautious, but what I am saying is we went overboard, and I cannot understand the overboard. He, uh, the, the Christian possesses the spirit within him and is able to discern, judge, and understand. Understand means know what God's plan is. That uh, a new Christian, a Christian that's been a Christian for 30 years but never done anything with it, they know what the end is. Okay? They know that one day they'll walk with Christ. They might not have done anything their whole time, but they know it because they learned it at some point in their Christian life. They not, I, said, I already said it, they not only know things of man, the natural man, but also things of the spirit. A spiritual man possesses human spirit and divine spirit. God gives us intelligence. God gives us understanding of the world and the spirit. If we didn't understand the world, we could very easily become ignorant in society. <laughs> they think we are. But, but we, couldn't, we couldn't function in society, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We couldn't hold down our jobs if we were ignorant in the natural things. God gives us natural ability and spiritual ability, natural knowledge and spiritual knowledge. I already said it, but I'll read verse, chapter three, verse one. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh, as to infants in Christ. That's a slam. That is, you've received Christ, but you ain't done nothing with it. You've received Christ, but you're still living partly in the old way of life. You receive Christ, but you don't want to give up your stuff. You don't want to give up your sins. That's who he was talking to. He was talking to, excuse me, he was talking to the people in the church that were still living sort of, maybe a lot of the pagan lifestyle. They hadn't decided to follow Jesus completely. They decided to follow him half-heartedly. Sometimes I feel like we even do that. And I'll put my hand up as the preacher. Sometimes I lose focus and I lose track. I'm thankful that God brings me back. But I'm not perfect. I'm not the perfect child of God. I'm only perfect in God's eyes. Not in my eyes or the earth's, the world's eyes. The second verse says, and I, and I just paraphrased it, but you never grew. That's the pew sitter. That's the person that sits in the back of the church and never listens, colors, writes notes to their neighbor, talks, does all those things. They never grew. They just got their fire insurance and they're, they're satisfied with that. I can't be the judge whether they're Christians or not. God is. Jesus is actually but I, I, I need to be aware I need to preach it harder to those people it says you never grew verse 2 says you drink milk you're living on milk 
as a baby does, as a baby Christian, you're living on the milk of the Word instead of solid food. The King James Version, I believe, says meat of the Word. So are you growing up on milk? What happens to Sam? You were a nurse. You were a baby. You worked with babies. What happens if they never come off that milk? They don't mature. They're babies. They may start walking. May. I said may. They may make it to the first or second grade. But if all they ever have is milk, they'll be invalids maybe? Is that a good way to put it? Put it? What are we as milk of the word as Christians? We're invalids in God's eyes. We got our fire insurance, but that's it. We need solid food. We need the meat of the word. We need to dig. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants to the Christ, to Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards than one be found trustworthy. I put there, let man regard us. Don't put me on a pedestal. Don't put a Christian on a pedestal. Because as soon as you do, they're going to they're gonna make a mistake. They're going to fall. They're going to cause you to stumble. Don't put me on a pedestal. Don't put Sam or Valette or... I'm just picking on y'all today, I guess. Or anybody else. Because what will happen, they'll say something, they'll do something, they'll go somewhere that, that you think is wrong. It might not be wrong to them, but when you're self-righteous and you see somebody that messes up, well, I can't believe she calls herself a Christian. I think I've said it before. Don't put somebody on a pedestal. We're all sinners saved by grace. Servants, Can't read my writing. Are we servants? Are we doing what God's called us to do? Do we do what God calls us to do every day? Stewards, entrusting us, because we're all supposed to be stewards, He's entrusting us for the responsibility to share our faith. What's our faith? Our divine revelation, the mysteries of God. It's the divine revelation of God. Again, when you're leading somebody to Christ, if you don't have confidence in what you believe, how are you going to tell somebody about the mystery of the virgin birth? The mystery of the man hanging on the cross? The mystery of him being raised again? You got to know it. Not be a baby. The last word, it is required of stewards. A steward is to be found faithful, reliable, and trustworthy. Stewards must first be faithful to Christ, but also to the church. Are you faithful? We are. We're here just about every time the doors are open. But do we have brothers and sisters that are not? Do we beat them up or do we encourage them? I've been guilty of beating up before. Okay? We have to encourage. Are you faithful to Christ? Do you faithfully support attend, give, participate with your spiritual gifts to the church? Do you participate? I'm going to pick on Sam and Valette again. We don't worry about Wednesday or Monday morning breakfast. It's always here. It's always here. That's a gift. We don't worry about Wednesday night meal. 
because it's always here. We don't worry about Sunday school because we always have somebody to teach it. We don't worry about the sound system because we always got somebody there. We don't worry about Sunday school because Ron's a lot better at it than I am, okay? And he'll be here next Sunday, okay? But we don't worry about it because God puts people in place to do the job. What are you doing for the kingdom of God? That's the point. Are you a pew sitter or a convenience Christian? I know some. And this message was the one that I was supposed to do second service. I'm doing the first. <laughs> but sometimes we even have pew sitters in the first service and the second service. Convenience Christians. I come because it's convenient. Some are not even Christians. But they come because they're supposed to. Think about it. I put it here at the top of it. Don't get mad at me. Take it up with God's Word. I mean, it's truth. Are you a pew sitter? Well, I'm throwing stuff out. Sherry, I'm putting you on the spot. Every three to four weeks, without fail, since she started coming to this church, she brings me food to give out. She brings us clothes to give out. She gives us this. That's not a pew sitter. And if, if, if I tell her, well, Sherry, I don't know if anybody needs anything right now. You know what she does? She brings money and says, give this to somebody you know needs it. That's what God has called us to do is to reach out over and over and over. Now, I'm sorry if, I, if I'm pointing people out and you're not getting pointed out, but all, everybody in here does something. But these are the ones that really stand out that I know about. There's others that do things that I don't even know about. What do you do for Christ outside of the church? God is our judge. Next slide. there <clears throat> but to me it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court in other words I don't care what you think that's really what he's saying I don't care what you think in fact I don't even examine myself for I am conscious of nothing against myself yet I am not by this acquitted why is he not acquitted because we all have sin in our life. We all mess up. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Now, if I stand up here and start preaching heresy, I need to be examined. But I'll tell you how I handled it before, okay? When we had a pastor that was not 100%, he, he, he did a good message, but every once in a while he'd throw, throw in this curveball that wasn't accurate. Every time he did it, I walked up to the podium as soon as church was over and said, you were wrong, Pastor, this is why. And I'd use scripture. But others spent all of their time. I'd walk into church on Sunday morning. Do you know what the pastor did? Do you know what he said? Do you know what he did? You know what my response always was? If he becomes unfaithful to God's word, we remove him. But until then, it's God's place to remove that pastor. We do not tear the church apart to ruin a pastor. Well, guess what? One day, without anybody knowing, he stood up in the pulpit, and instead of preaching his message, he read his letter of resignation and walked out. See, that was prayers being answered without the garbage going on inside the church. That's how we're supposed to handle it. If I mess up, I can promise you that Ron will let me know the Sunday that I do it. If not Sunday, if Debbie's rushing him out, Monday. I can promise you he will. If I mess up today, I can promise you Berlin will say something to me after church. Okay. See, I'm not as educated as many. But I believe God's word, word for word. And sometimes I say something wrong. Sometimes I call the wrong name. Sometimes I quote the wrong verse at the wrong time like I did last time. 
last week. But I love my, the Word of God. Paul was saying, I'm doing nothing, none, I'm doing none of this for anybody but God. I'm not doing it for man. I'm not standing up here for y'all. I'm standing up here for God. I'm standing up here to preach God's Word because He called me to do it. It took a long time for me to answer. But I'm doing it because that's what He's called me to do. He says, I, my conscious, I, I, I am conscious of nothing I played a song this morning. I almost said I was going to do it at church. In my conscious of nothing against myself, I put, I've surrendered all to Christ. I've surrendered everything to Christ. I'm giving my whole life to Christ. But I'm still human. Paul was still human. And he might make a mistake. Probably didn't after he became a Christian. I don't know that. He did. He was still human. But you understand what I'm saying. He never did it intentionally. I've surrendered all. Paul surrendered all. Not by this acquitted, by this acquitted. What he was saying is I'm not worthy of it. Is there anybody here today that's a Christian that's worthy of being a Christian? We're not. It's only by the grace of God that we can claim I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. And one who examines me is the Lord. I give it all to Christ. My whole message, my whole thought process, my whole life process is in Christ's hands. And again, I mess up but it's still all for God. It's all, that's the purpose, and it should be the purpose of every true believer. We give it all to Christ. What did, what did we start out? It's all true or none of it's true. It's all His or none of it's His. We're either for Christ or we're against Him. If we're in the middle, we're against Him. That's what the Bible says. Stewardship. Stewardship implies responsibility. Responsibility uh, implies accountability. Are you responsible? And are you accountable? Are you responsible in the way you serve Christ? And are you accountable in what you say and do in serving Christ? Where are you at? Christians one day will give an account of their stewardship and will be judged according to the faithfulness of the steward. Now, there's different paths on that judgment, okay? And I'll tell you, standing here in the pulpit, I believe, okay, that when I face that ju judgment, Jesus will stay, stand right there beside me and say, Father, he's my child, he's my child. I died for him. Jesus will say, enter into the gates. That's what I believe. Everybody doesn't believe that. Every group doesn't believe that. And it took a long time for me to come to that conclusion because I was taught differently. But if Jesus forgives all sin, he forgives all sin. If he forgives all sin, why is it going to come back up? Why? Why is he going to bury me with it when I'm already in heaven? Again, there's different thought processes. That's the conclusion I have come to. But one day they'll be judged according to their faithfulness as stewards. Now, I don't believe in a work salvation, but I do believe in works because of salvation. Okay? That will be my crowns. Does that make sense? That will be my crowns. Because I'm already a Christian, but what am I going to do for Christ? Christians are not our judges. 
We don't have the right to judge people. We can be fruit inspectors, but we can't, ju we can't judge them because we don't know their heart. We don't know how, what God is what they're dealing with in their life. We're their fruit inspectors. We're encouraging them, but we can't judge them. He's also saying there that no human court is my judge. I've said it before. If I, somebody comes through that back door because I'm preaching the truth and they arrest me, I'll preach in jail. It don't matter. I hope that I have enough of a memory to use God's Word in my preaching until one of my church members brings me a Bible. Because they won't let me have mine. And mine is marked up like crazy. But I don't answer to the courts. I answer to God alone. That's why we didn't bow down when they started trying to close the churches. We made it easy. We made it convenient. We said, if you don't come, that's your right. But we will be here. We are stewards of the church. Are, are, you, are we, we are not stewards of the church or man, but God. That's what we're called to be. Our responsibility is to the church, faithfulness, and biblical truth. Verse 4, Jesus is our only judge. He alone knows our heart and our motives and our secrets. I don't know your motives. I don't know if they're for self-gain or for God-gain. I don't know your heart. I only know what you tell me. God knows your heart. Now, a lot of times I can tell, but even I've even been fooled. I, I, I sat under a pastor for years. I knew him before he became a Christian, and he was already preaching. Okay? A big question was raised to me. Well, what about all those people he led to the Lord while he was unsaved? Are they really Christians? Well, yeah. Okay? They are. But he was preaching for years before he ever became a, a Christian. And one night he was preaching a message on surrendering everything. And before he met, finished his message, he got down on the knees and confessed his sin and asked Jesus in his heart. What an impact. I wasn't there, but I heard about it. Okay? Who are you living for? He alone knows our heart. I'll finish with John 5, 22. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. See, when we get to heaven and we face that great white throne judgment, okay? Or if I said that word wrong, the, the final judgment, okay? When we face that, what's it just say right there? Only the Son judges. What did I say? Paul lived a good life, and, and we don't know of any sin. I didn't say this exactly, but we don't know of any sin that Paul did after he became a Christian, okay? And he had a rough road. But Paul still had to have something. And if nothing else, if nothing else, the thorn he had, because he asked God over and over and over and over and over until at the end he said, your faith is sufficient. You know, he just kept wanting, why have I got this? Why is this going on in my life? Why do I have this? It was to keep him humble. It was to keep him on track, to keep him serving God who had rescued him from sin. So I didn't, I didn't mean to imply that, that he had no sin, and I didn't think I did. But, but I do, but what he was saying was, you can't judge me. The courts can't judge me. 
Only God can judge me. And he, what's it, what's, how did it close? And he acquitted, I'm on the wrong, yeah. Not, but yet I am not by this acquitted. I'm not acquitted because I'm living the perfect life. I'm not acquitted because I'm a good showman. I'm not acquitted by anything but the blood of Jesus.